Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, Alec Gorf. Alex received his PhD from the University of Zurich and uh, followed this by a postdoc at UC San Diego. He then joined uh, the University of Texas Health Center in Houston in 2009, where uh, he has uh, now been promoted through the ranks and is a tenured professor. Uh, so Alex is well known for his beautiful work in computational biochemistry and biophysics, especially work that interfaces uh, systems that involve both proteins and lipids. And uh, we will hear about this today. Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, John, uh, for the introduction and thank you, you and Rams for inviting me to talk uh, in this Zoom in, Zoominar series. And I have been um, watching the talks, uh, not all uh, admittedly, and it was really fantastic so far. Uh, uh, most of the talks I've seen were on developmental disorders. Mine is going to be slightly different. It's more on cancer and uh, develop, de developmental diseases. Um, and I will uh, focus on the, the one part of uh, proteins called RAS proteins, it's, they have this intrinsically disordered C-terminal uh, segment and my focus today would be, would be on that. And just to introduce uh, RAS, uh, most of you might be familiar with it already, but just to give a little bit uh, of a background. Uh, so it's a GTP hydrolyzing enzyme. It's called, this is a classical example of con conformational switches that switch between GDP bound and uh, inactive and GTP bound active conformations facilitated by uh, guanine nucleotide exchange factors and uh, GTPs uh, uh, activating proteins. So, so it's, it's an enzyme on its own, but it's a, a sluggish enzyme. So, so it requires the activities of these uh, two other proteins. Uh, the key aspect uh, of RAS and the one that I have been interested in for a long time since I was with Amadio Kaprich, now he uh, has joined, uh, uh, is the lipid modified uh, C-terminal uh, part of the protein, although we have worked on the, on the rest of the protein for a long time. My focus today would be on this linker and anchor region. So uh, upon, tran uh, tra uh, upon translation, RAS gets processed uh, by a variety of uh, uh, enzymes, farnesyl transferases, RAS con converting enzyme that uh, uh, process this CAX motif, CAX motif, and attach a farnesyl uh, tail uh, that allows RAS to uh, target the plasma membrane uh, where it transduces uh, signals from receptor ty tyrosine kinases to downstream effectors and all the way to the nucleus. And usually these this signals uh, involve uh, uh, cell uh, proliferation, uh, growth, development, and, and so forth. So this RAS is really a control uh, for those pathways. So it's an oncogene, one of the first to, to be discovered. Uh, uh, and it has, so it has been uh, well characterized and well known to be associated with uh, about 20% of all human uh, cancer. So there is a lot going on uh, lately in, in particular to try to inhibit RAS signaling uh, to, uh, using a variety of approaches. One of those is the covalent inhibition of one particular mutation, D12C. Uh, uh, but there are many other mutations that represent probably 5% of the uh, uh, RAS-related uh, cancers, and there are no drugs for, those, uh, for them, and the uh, work still continues. So we have an active program in that direction. Uh, my focus today, however, is going to be how RAS interacts with membranes and how this linker and anchor regions uh, modulate the membrane binding uh, and function. So, so there are three isoforms of RAS proteins that are highly conserved in sequence, as you can see here. In lobe one, uh, which is essentially the first half of the protein uh, or catalytic domain, is 100% conserved. Lobe two is about 95% conserved, but the hypervariable region, the HBR, is highly divergent in sequence, and as you will see later also in uh, in structure. Just a few points to highlight about the catalytic domain: the, the lobe two is where you have all these mutations, about five, six of them. 
among H, N, and Keras proteins. And as you can see, these proteins are found mutated in uh, different cancers and developmental disorders, including Noonan syndrome, uh, for, for example. And they are uh, really different in uh, not just in sequence of the HBR, uh, but also the, the in terms of their lipid modification. The HRAS is modified by two palmitoils and a farnesyl. NRAS by palmitoil and farnesyl. KRAS uh, has just one farnesyl, but it has this polybasic region, lysine re rich region, that as you will see would be really critical in how uh, KRAS attaches to membrane surfaces. So uh, just before I go into the, some of our latest results, uh, I wanted to give you some, some background about what we have been doing for many years and what we have learned from them. Uh, when I started, this was how we thought RAS would be sitting on the membrane surface. So this is a bilayer, uh, the farnesyl, which is a hydrophobic uh, moiety would enter into the core of the bilayer. And the catalytic domain, as you can see here, is bilobal, would sit in water and hanging in there. And the HVR is flexible, so it would be sampling a large, uh, uh, large conformational space. That was uh, how I thought it would work, but that turned out to be not quite right. And uh, the, 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 that is in part because not only the catalytic domain uh, has these multiple conformational states, I mentioned already inactive GTP and active GTP states, but the GTP state can also be subdivided into substates S1, S2, and uh, even further. So uh, further studies on this HVR uh, led to the idea that, it, yes, it is disordered, but it has also some residual structural features, one, two, three here. This is from uh, a review uh, by uh, the MOT group uh, uh, and for uh, another RAS super family member, but not quite RAS, but RAS behaves very much uh, uh, in the same way. So the focus today would be last, largely on the role of the HBR. So uh, if I knew Amadio would be here, I would have started uh, from our paper together many years ago. But uh, this is uh, uh, from the work that partly done when I was with him and the, the, then a few years after that. So it, when we looked at the lipid anchor of HRAS, this is uh, uh, represented here in the middle with this stick and, uh, and ball model. So it uh, very much looks like a bona fide lipid. This is DMPC, for example. There is this polar region represented by side chains as a serine and uh, lysine and glycine and the uh, lipid tails. Uh, this HD186, by the way, is, is a, a model we used to use to represent Farnesyl. Now we uh, uh, actually have the actual Farnesyl in simulations. But nonetheless, uh, the idea is that the lipid modified uh, moiety would, in, uh, would insert deep into the core of the, uh, the hydrophobic core of the bilayer. The polar region would sit uh, uh, at the interface between the water and the lipid membrane. Uh, just like the head group of uh, uh, any phospholipid would. So it has these lipidic characteristics, but also uh, the, the, some of the uh, features of peptides, uh, uh, as I will discuss later. So uh, upon insertion into the bilayer, this is uh, the extra lipid anchor, it uh, uh, in, induces localized changes in lipid dynamics, lipid conformation. This is just a, uh, an example of you know, how the lipid conformations from the other the opposing leaflet can be affected by the insertion uh, of the HRAS lipid anchor and how that would lead to changes in the order parameter um, uh, of lipids around the uh, peptides. This is anchor is just a lipid anchor and HBR is when we have the longer tail included and the, the full length GDP and GTP. So, and as you can see, the effect is not identical among the different constructs. There are uh, variations, but the bottom line is that the uh, uh, insertion of these peptides or proteins into bilayers uh, has an impact on the local structure uh, of the membrane. 
We also did some free energy calculations. This is again a long time ago uh, when I was with Andy Markamon. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the accuracy of the calculations, the, you know, might be debated because, uh, you know, the sampling was limited at the time, but it was close to the ex experimental estimates. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, these lipid modified motors provide a large amount of free energy uh, or, uh, for the insertion uh, of, of the peptides and the proteins and to keep them there. There are ways to extract RAS proteins uh, from the membrane, uh, including use it by digesting the, for example, the palmitoyl uh, tails, cutting them off, uh, uh, or using other scaffolding proteins uh, that would uh, facilitate extraction of the pharmacy. Uh, but uh, if left alone, this is a very large amount of free energy. So uh, uh, these uh, peptides and proteins can uh, interact with, slip, uh, with membrane very strongly. And the uh, form of interactions uh, appears to be enthalpy driven. And uh, one thing I would like to point out is uh, this is again for HRAS and where we were still using the hexadecyl to represent farnesyl. But looking at using the same calculation and looking at different constructs with, uh, for example, uh, just a farnesyl and one palmitoil or just two palmitoils or all three. Uh, we, 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 we found that the, the contribution of the individual tails of the RAS peptide is not identical. Of course, without a lipid modification, there would be no insertion. And we also tried to uh, de decompose the energetic contributions from interactions, conformational changes, uh, and so forth. And we concluded that it is largely uh, an enthalpic uh, driven process. So now I'm including the HVR, that is this yellow region, uh, uh, together with the lipid modified moiety. And this is just a very simplified uh, representation of uh, results from simulations a uh, number of years ago. Uh, and this is, uh, at the time, really surprising for us. I was simulating the full length HRAS protein in a DMPC bilayer. And uh, in terms of uh, population, the, the, the conformation sampled by the two uh, nucleotide bound forms of HRAS was different. And this is just a summary of that. In one case, the dominant conformation when DTP was present looked like something like this, where uh, the, a couple of residues from the catalytic domains, particularly helix-4, uh, directly interact with lipids. And the shape of the HBR is different. Uh, and also notice this purple re region in the, uh, making close contact with helix five. In the GDP bound form, it's, it's entirely the opposite. Um, so this uh, was, uh, for the first time, it explained this nucleotide and HBR dependent membrane binding that was uh, observed previously in uh, cell biology, particularly EM imaging type uh, of experiments. Uh, and uh, more importantly, predicted for us, at least for me, something really important that RAS might indeed be an allosteric uh, protein. Uh, this, it was uh, by the time uh, an example of undragable uh, proteins and uh, nobody thought it would have allosteric properties. Now it's uh, regarded uh, as a typical allosteric protein. Uh, but at the time that was really interesting. And that in led us to think about uh, the allosteric inhibition of RAS and so forth, but I won't go into that today. And uh, a few other um, lessons, immunostructures, you know, thermodynamic function. Uh, John Hancock, uh, now the chair of my department, uh, we were collaborating, he was in Australia at the time. They did a number of uh, uh, cell assays to try to see if this residues that I showed you in the previous slide uh, as interacting with lipids have any functional role and they mutated them to alanine. And as you can see, this is, uh, by the way, phosphor or ERK level, that's what they're measuring, that's the readout. Uh, and upon mutation of this HVR residues, there is this uh, hyperactive variant. Mutation of helix-4 uh, residues reduces uh, phosphor ERK level slightly relative to the constitutively active G12B variant. And uh, also a number of other mutations uh, had uh, turned out to have an, an impact in function, an effective function. 
And we uh, uh, thought that could be explained by this kind of uh, process where GDP bound confirmations and GTP bound confirmations are uh, in equilibrium. I notice the different orientations and the different confirmations of the HVR in yellow here. And that led us to the salocery and population shift type uh, of ideas for just membrane binding, but also ultimately for ligand design. There was uh, also this, uh, the, the idea of RAS forming clusters or nano clusters, nano size uh, proteolipid uh, clusters or aggregates on uh, the plasma membrane that was again uh, documented by EM. And we had no idea what the structural uh, uh, and physical basis, uh, physical chemical basis of that was at, at the time. And uh, we made an attempt to model that. And the, the hypothesis or the idea was that the, this uh, RAS inserting into one side of the membrane would lead to interleaflet area differences. So that would uh, perturb monolayer uh, coupling and, and those kinds of. Uh, effects would usually lead to uh, curvature and sub subsequently uh, uh, the domain formation. And uh, variations in insertion depths uh, of the uh, uh, different proteins would also uh, affect membrane structure, backbone localization, and so forth. So we wanted to couple the, this phase separation of lipids with nano clustering of peptides, and to, uh, then wanted to see if the, stab the relative stability of the small uh, nano-sized lipid domains would be stabilized by, uh, stabilized or, or destabilized uh, for that matter, by RAS proteins. And we uh, built this kind of construct, uh, simulation construct. Uh, this is for the full length protein, but I will show you just an example or a summary of what we have seen for the uh, HRAS lipid anchors. A small heptapeptide, as you can see here to the left, and we simulated this uh, the, uh, the 2010 11 using uh, Martini coarse grain model. And these are the lipid compositions DPPC, DLIPC, and cholesterol. Uh, different temperatures, uh, different cholesterol concentrations. We worked, as I said, both with both the full length and uh, this small uh, uh, peptide. But the key proper properties of lateral dynamics clustering uh, can be really uh, captured by this small peptide. And this is a summary to the right. The image is uh, our attempt to show the structure of the NLD domain, which is uh, this blue region here. Uh, the membrane thickness uh, is shorter relative to the LO domain or raft-like domain, where, which is enriched by cholesterol. So those are these great uh, structures and uh, the thickness is high. The peptides would aggregate cluster and they tend to go to the domain boundary uh, really invariably. And ultimately what we concluded was that the same fundamental forces that phase separate or segregate lipids based on acid chain, uh, acid chain saturation, for example, would also segregate uh, RAS peptides from the, uh, this LD uh, or uh, LO or pure phase in general uh, to domain boundaries and, uh, and also uh, uh, force them to cluster. And cholesterol, the role of cholesterol would then be to simply facilitate lipid domain formation. And the more uh, stable the domain is, the, 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 the more stable the, lip, the, the TH clusters uh, uh, turned out to be. And just to, uh, to give you, show you some data, not just a summary. Uh, this is how the distribution uh, of the TH, TH is the, the, the lipid anchor of uh, HRAS, uh, would, would look like in this bilayer, just show, looking at it from, from the top. The blue would be the LD region, and uh, the, this, uh, the greenish uh, and yellow would be LO, or li liquid order domain. Uh, green is uh, DPPC and white is cholesterol. And the monomers would distribute through, throughout the membrane, but the clusters tend to go to the, to the boundaries as highlighted here. And here is a quantification of that. Uh, again, to the right is a wild type uh, TH and the black dashed line represent the, the distribution of these peptides uh, in the bilayer, simply uh, shown here in 2D. 
we center the, the, everything at the LO, the liquid order domain, and the LD would be on, on, on each side. Uh, and the dash, the vertical lines, uh, dotted vertical lines represent the domain boundary. And as you can see, the vast majority of the peptides tend to accumulate at the domain boundaries. But the most important thing is when we uh, depalmitolate uh, one by one or uh, take, get rid of, uh, of them, them both, you would see quite distinct uh, distributions. So if we uh, take out one palmitoyl group in blue and cyan here, the distribution is pretty similar to the wild type. So it's, it means that as long as we have one farnesyl, one palmitoyl tail, they tend to go to the domain boundary. But just farnesyl, this, uh, this green here, uh, would lead to uh, the relocalization of the peptides to mostly to the LD domain. That make, made sense because the farnesyl is polyunsaturated, it's highly flexible. So it would prefer uh, to go to the more flexible uh, liquid disordered regions uh, uh, of the bilayer. And if we have just the palmitoils, it would be mostly in the ordered region uh, where it can pack better with the DPPC. That, uh, uh, saturated uh, lipids. So that's um, after what, what, I, what I talked about so far is uh, on old older data, uh, but it gives you an idea of how the, the interplay of the lipid lipidations on these peptides and the backbone and the side chain contribute to uh, not just to membrane binding, but also lateral dynamics, clustering, and so forth. So. Most recently, we have been focused uh, almost ex exclusively on Keras, uh, but all the, uh, both the full length uh, protein and uh, the, the individual uh, constructs such as the lipid anchor. But I will uh, mostly talk about the lipid anchor uh, for the rest of my talk today. And just to take you back to this idea of cluster formation, uh, what I showed you previously was uh, ETRAS, but there was a lot of data for Keras as well that it forms nanoclusters. And the cluster uh, properties are nucleotide dependent, as you can uh, as, uh, summarized here from work by Roland Winter uh, many years ago. GTP bound uh, Keras tend to form larger clusters compared to the GDP bound form, which are smaller. But both uh, localized to the LD domain, liquid, liquid disorder domain. Again, that made sense because KRAS has just one pharmacy, as you can see here. Uh, it doesn't have a palmitoil or say saturated lipid modification, but it has this uh, lysine, uh, polylysine segment. And uh, we wanted to know what their specific role would be, uh, not just in terms of clustering, but also other properties, as I'll show you later. And we did some simulation uh, 10 years ago or so. And uh, this was using uh, uh, POPC and POPG. Uh, we should have used POPS in retrospect because Keras prefers PS and PG is a bacterial lipid. But uh, we thought just the charge alone would be sufficient. But that was not really enough. But, so you will see later. But uh, what I wanted to show you here is that these peptides, four of them here, tend to segregate the negatively charged POPG lipids uh, and, uh, and, and, and they would be surrounded by them. So there is this co-clustering uh, or uh, of the P uh, PG lipids with, with the peptides. And the other observation was that the peptide tend to sample again in the, the backbone, a wide uh, region of conformational space. Uh, but there are some, some preferred conformations. And the question was, is there really anything between you know, the, a given conformation uh, and uh, lipid binding? Or for example, is one conformation more amenable for hydrogen bonding from, uh, with, with a PS lipid uh, rather than uh, versus another conformation? Uh, or would, would, would membrane insertion depths would be dependent on uh, conformation of the backbone? Those kinds of questions we were raising, and uh, also our collaborators here, Yong Zhou and John Hancock in our department. So that's where uh, this work 
published a few years ago uh, started to, to just inspire by this kind of very simple observations. Before I show you the data, what they do, these are um, not my own data that my, my collaborators produce this. We, we uh, worked on the project together. So uh, they use uh, electron microscopy uh, and uh, what they do is they uh, uh, express, they uh, topically express RAS proteins in BHK or uh, PSCS3 cells. It, this, this, these are, I think these examples are PSCS3 uh, cells. So they uh, topically express uh, the proteins and just rip off the plasma membrane uh, and image it. So using gold level antibodies that are specific to, to our uh, protein of interest in this case. Keras, and they would get this kind of uh, images, these black dots. The focus to the left first. Uh, and then they use re replay, replace K function for analysis, and they would get this kind of curves. So for what I will show you the, for the rest of my talk would be uh, LMAX, that is just the maximum value uh, of the curve here. For the black, for example, it would be about uh, 4.5 or so. That, as a summary uh, statistic, uh, of uh, clustering uh, of a protein, in this case, the G12B keras. These are univariate uh, 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 analysis uh, using uh, replace K function. But if we wanted to see a co-localization of two uh, molecules, keras G12B and QOPS, for example, keras would be labeled with GFP and uh, POPS would be labeled, for example, with lac C2. This is uh, specific for PS and both would be, uh, would, 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 be uh, would have different colors and they can be uh, again imaged using EM as you can see here. And this kind of uh, covariate uh, uh, distribution uh, of uh, uh, replace K function can be derived and they take the area under, under the curve to uh, summarize the data. So that's what uh, uh, I'll be showing from here on. Here on. So, oh, one, one more thing. They, they can also count these particles and that, that will tell us the, the membrane recruitment, how, much, how many of these molecules are actually uh, recruited to the plasma membrane. So I'll use those, those three metrics. So uh, this, that, that, the, the last one I talked about uh, can be, uh, is this gold level, uh, leveling by, per micro meter square. So it's a measure of surface density on the inner plate of the plasma membrane. So, so they took uh, the, the cells, BHK cells in this case, and simply wanted to see uh, how much PS uh, is available first, that's this measure on the, on the plasma membrane. So the, the, that will tell you there are about uh, 500 or so uh, PS uh, per square micron. And, and they have this molecule called Fendlin that, uh, that extracts or, or depopulates PS from the plasma membrane through a complicated mechanism. mechanism. It targets a particular enzyme called sphingomyelinase and that inhibits PS production and therefore there would be less PS on the, on the surface uh, uh, of the membranes. And then they add back PS to sort of reconstitute or repopulate PS on the membrane surface. And that's what they do. And the, what they are adding back in the first uh, case is brain PS derived from uh, the brain cells and uh, the various uh, lipids, all PS, but different chain saturation levels. So as you can see here, this is uh, the first one is fully saturated PS, and then we have the mono saturated, uh, unsaturated PS and so forth. And uh, as you can see, uh, the PS levels can be restored pretty easily to, to the wild type level or even better. And then they looked at uh, K12G, V keras uh, localization on the PM. Again, this is DMSO control uh, uh, upon uh, depletion of PS, that's the black. And when they add back these various uh, PS lipids, the membrane binding properties of G12V keras uh, are, are, are restored. Okay, when PS is depleted, keras would be dislodged from the membrane because it requires PS for uh, uh, 
the tight binding to the membrane. But not every PS species uh, restores uh, uh, the PM localization uh, of G12 vicaras. So this the, the dye, uh, the, the fully saturated PS, for example, would not. And more importantly, the clustering uh, is really uh, enabled uh, by the brain PS or this, uh, this asymmetric PS species, species where one tail is saturated and the other tail is unsaturated. And that was uh, surprising. So there is, it's not just the head group or the chart that matters, but also the tail saturation level. Uh, and they, again, using this LBI value, values that I, I talked about, they uh, looked at co-clustering of phosphatidyl serine and G12 V keras. And as you can see here again, wild type PS depletion would, uh, would clearly lead, lead to less co-localization of the two species. And only the brain PS, uh, which has all, uh, all kinds of PS species, including this as the asymmetric ones and the asymmetric uh, external lipids restore co-localization uh, of phosphatidyl cell in the G12 V keras. Uh, 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 this has uh, functional consequences. This CRAF is a vector of keras, so that the two have to co-localize to transduce signal uh, downstream. And as you can see here, only the brain PS and again the uh, uh, the asymmetric PS. Uh, enable co-localization of G12 vicaras and CIRA and not the others, showing clearly that there is a connection between acid chain and saturation uh, and uh, uh, signaling through G12 vicaras. And that's, of course, mediated by membrane binding. So, so that led us to this uh, the conclusion that Kera, the keras membrane anchor might be combinatorial code that requires the activities of the uh, polybasic domain as well as the pharnacil group as I, will, I haven't talked about that yet but i will show you later later on uh, uh, that selectively binds to ps but not just to any ps but to this asymmetric uh, ps species that are uh, that have uh, one chain saturated and the other unsaturated mono unsaturated uh, so this is uh, this is some more, some more data. This is again uh, co -lo localize, uh, PM localization of G12 V keras using this gold labeling uh, measures. But what we do here is mutate this individual lysine residues. As uh, I sh should have mentioned earlier, that in that previous simulation paper, we uh, the one other thing we saw was that not all lysines are are, are equal as far as lipid binding uh, uh, is concerned. Some lysines tended to form more persistent hydrogen bonds than the other. So that was the basis of these mutations. Uh, so they wanted to, to see if that makes made sense uh, in cells. And surprisingly, that turned out to be the case. So, you know, in case 177Q, for example, uh, that just single point mutation uh, dislodged keras from the membrane, or it won't be able. It, it, uh, it that mutation dis disabled its its, its uh, uh, removed its ability to target the PM. Uh, and the nano clustering is similarly affected, and this is simply another measure to see uh, to, to confirm the uh, results at the top. This is the fraction of cytosolic keras with these mutations. Uh, with respect to total keras and the uh, K177Q mutant is mostly cytosolic uh, relative to the, the relative to the the other uh, mutations and again fret efficiency uh, is decreased so simply confirming the data uh, at the top so the bottom line here is again these lysines are not really uh, the same as far as their interactions or role in membrane binding uh, is, is concerned. So on top of that, the, they, uh, we found that this G12V uh, protein, uh, uh, when we use, uh, again, a con as a control, this uh, the wild type uh, protein the, or wild type PS content, 
uh, and then deplete it and uh, to, to add back either brand PS or brand PIP2. Uh, this is what you get. P brand PS uh, the increases the uh, plasma membrane binding uh, of G12B keras. I should uh, correct myself here. These are not uh, depleted of PS. This is uh, the wild type PS content. So on top of that, adding uh, this uh, external uh, PS species, of course, the more PS we have, the more G12B keras tended to be recruited to the plasma membrane. But the PIP2 does not do that. That's another highly charged lipid in the plasma membrane. But this Q177, uh, K177Q and uh, K178Q are now sensitive to the PIP content, but not to the PS content. So the Negative, uh, negatively charged lipids uh, preferences have been reversed or altered by the single point mutations. And that was, uh, again, uh, really interesting. So uh, PS selectivity is dependent on the sequence uh, or the precise sequence of the lipid anchor uh, uh, of Keras. Uh, there are a few other uh, mutations that I didn't really uh, talk about here. The, 6R, for example, that's just replace, replacing all of the lysines by arginines, and that too has uh, an effect. You don't really see it here, but in uh, uh, other measures, and I'll come back to that a bit later. So what about phosphorylation at this serine? But the phosphorylation has been known uh, to uh, decrease the affinity of Keras for the plasma membrane. Uh, and what is the specific role of, again, the, this, this uh, Farnesyl group? So that is what we wanted to see here. So what you see, the GG here is a, a replacement of the Farnesyl by geranil-geranil group. So that's another prenyl modification, but uh, and it was an extra five carbon atoms. And this, uh, this is uh, phosphor, 181 phosphor is phosphorylation at serine 181. And the, as you can see here, the individual mutations uh, affect co-localization of, in this case, TK, just this lipid anchor. The previous slide was the full length protein. Uh, the, this is just mutating uh, the, the residues in this isolated lipid anchor. And now we are looking at, it is uh, co-localization with phosphat, the tidal serine in general. And of course, phosphorylation of this residue affected the co-localization of this peptide with phosphatid and serine. Uh, the geranil geranil replacement uh, didn't, but these point mutations had significant effect. With PIP2 again, the, the other mutations are insensitive, but the phospho uh, mutant and the K177Q and K178Q mutants are now PIP sensitive, where the others uh, are not. And uh, this can be, uh, again, quantified using this freight efficiency uh, approaches is essentially confirming the results uh, at the top. So then we wanted to see, you know, to go back to our original hypothesis and see if there, if there is any connection between this uh, uh, negatively charged lipid sensitivity and confirmation of Keras. And we ran simulations for a microsecond to two microsecond or so uh, at the time. And these are different Keras variants. And the, the bottom line is this, we uh, using, this is Charm M36, if there are uh, people interested in some of the details. Uh, and we saw this uh, distribution of ordered, we call it ordered, uh, intermediate and disordered uh, conformations in, in all of the different variants. But the fractional distribution of those is, is different. In the middle, uh, what I'm showing is roughly how the shapes of conformations look like with the membrane in the background. But of course, these are not quite representative. This is just to give you an, a general idea. Here at the top uh, is the probability distribution of the different conformations using RMSD, I, O, and D uh, for the different mutants, K177Q K177, and green. K177, uh, 178Q in blue and so forth. And you clearly see variations in uh, the in conformational sampling or dynamics uh, of these different point mutants. We tried to 
derive uh, free energy or a potential of mean force based on either the, the probability distribution at the top or uh, for using metadynamics that is in lighter shade here in the bottom. Uh, and as you can see here, there is a significant sufficient overlap. So clearly we have uh, way more to sample for these things to converge, but this data is clearly suggestive of variations in conformations uh, upon mutation uh, or phosphorylation or the presence of the geranyl-geranyl group. That's particularly surprising because we didn't really touch the backbone that was a side chain uh, a replacement of just a, a lipid tail. But that affected membrane binding and therefore conformation uh, of the peptides. I will probably have to go a little faster now. So this uh, is a summary of how those different conformations, either in the disordered order or intermediate uh, conformations of the different mutants would form hydrogen bonds with POPS to the left or POPC to the right. Uh, uh, and one means highly persistent uh, hydrogen bond formation, zero means not, none, uh, nothing. And you can see the really clear variations in their ability to interact with phosphatidyl uh, serine. There is not much interaction with POPC that was expected, except for the last lysine residue that uh, seems to form some hydrogen bonds. But the others are interacting with POPS, but with various capacities. So this, uh, again, left us with a lingering question, what is really, really the role of electrostatics uh, in all of this. And uh, for that, we thought, we asked another question, do equally charged Keras polybasic domains uh, 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 sample distinct conformation, uh, conformational states on bilayers of the same lipid composition? That's number one, these are TK, that's the wild type. This is, it is TKC20 means with geranyl, geranyl group. 6R is all Lysines replaced by, or this, this, this lysine stretch replaced by an arginine, and 6RC20 is arginine class, geranyl, geranyl. So the other question is what about the acyl chains uh, uh, of the lipids? And can we learn something uh, from simulations? I told you that the uh, um, uh, interaction of Keras lipid anchors and full length protein is sensitive to the acyl chain uh, of the lipids. So this is the uh, first one we simulated the TK wild type. You have seen that before, TKC20 with six uh, arginines and six arginines and geranyl geranyl group. The insects are not quite visible. That's simply to show that there are some differences in the way these peptides absorb on the membrane. But the important thing is, again, the backbone conformational sampling uh, is distinct, distinct among them. And uh, their interaction with uh, phosph phosphatidyl serine is also different. These simulations are with uh, POPC and POPS. And clearly the arginines tend to interact with, uh, 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 with PS more strongly, but even within the different arginine uh, containing peptides, there are variations, uh, uh, not just in conformation, but also in lipid binding. And if we uh, simulate again this uh, equally charged polybasic domains in uh, the charges con conserved, the TK wild type has six, six lysines, TK6R has six arginines. Uh, but now we also vary the, uh, the bilayer. So these simulations are in POPC, PO, uh, POPS to the left, POPC, DSPS. This is poly uh, saturated uh, uh, PS species. Then we can see clear differences in lateral dynamics that is as estimated by this mean square displacement. Uh, but also if we look at the wild type and uh, the uh, GFR or, or to, to, to quantify its interaction with the head group of uh, PS lipids, the different PS lipids, there, is, there are variations uh, between them. So the, the, the bilayer uh, composition matters. The, amino acid distribution and backward conformation of uh, the uh, peptides at uh, Keras lipid anchors uh, matter. So we tested this again using various assays uh, based mostly on the uh, EM. And, but these are different cells. These are PA, uh, P, 
PSA3 cells uh, with one of the enzymes, the synthesis that produces phosphatidyl serine uh, knockdown. Uh, okay. And when these cells are treated with ethanolamine, they produce a lot of PS, reducing one, the remaining uh, enzymes. There are two enzymes that uh, uh, help form uh, uh, PS in, this, in these cells. Uh, and uh, without uh, uh, ethanolamine, they don't form uh, um, uh, PS. So as you can see here, there are few PS uh, uh, when, there is, uh, this, this, uh, when they are grown without ethanolamine when this uh, grows uh, uh, condition. And we'll add back with uh, DSPS, POPS, uh, and DOPS uh, would restore PS uh, uh, on the uh, plasma membrane, but not all. Again, this DSPS doesn't, but the other uh, polysaturated, un uh, unsaturated species do. The same with Keras uh, membrane, uh, Keras clustering, uh, Kera, uh, and also uh, uh, localization on the membrane. I'm not showing that here. Okay, uh, and uh, they have done the same thing for the C20, that is with Geralin, Geralinated species, uh, in terms of uh, gold labeling, uh, as well as LMAX. Uh, and uh, also gold leveling and LMAX for the 6R. And as you can see here, the PS sensitivity is different uh, for the C20, for example, they don't, uh, the, the, well, if we have just the, the polylysin and the geralin geralin group, geralin geralin, geralin groups, they don't really uh, care. Uh, each PS would restore uh, uh, gold, uh, gold leveling or membrane binding, whereas Clustering is slightly affected, but this uh, 6R is now uh, in, uh, restored uh, to the plasma membrane using really all three PS species, uh, but clustering uh, is possible primarily using this polysaturated, group, the fully saturated uh, lipid species. Um, again, this is for the other peptide, the 6R C20 polyarginine. Uh, and the C20 motif, again, very different uh, sensitivity towards lipids. So I leave this uh, uh, interplay between backbone conformation, uh, hydrogen bonding potential, uh, and lip, uh, lipid acyl chain sensitivity uh, with, with this data. And just to uh, very briefly talk about one, make one point and then conclude. The HBR, as I said, is highly dynamic and uh, it not only uh, matters for lipid uh, recognition or lipid sorting, but it also is important for membrane reorientation of the catalytic domain on the membrane surface. This is just one example for KRAS G12D. This is uh, just uh, uh, how the free energy uh, surface are estimated from uh, Anton simulations would look like. So we have two major basins, we call them orientation state one and two. But in each case, it is, it's a really shallow surface. And uh, in each case, there are multiple uh, different orientations uh, within uh, each uh, basin. And this is primarily driven by the dynamics of the HB HBR. That is a lipid anchor I was uh, talking about uh, earlier and uh, about 10 re residues towards the catalytic domain. So that is critical uh, for membrane reorientation. That is uh, uh, also illustrated here, three orientations, uh, 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 and this uh, shape and conformation of this green region, the HBR, is critical for their dynamics. These are important for function. This is a very simple illustration of that. If we overlay the RAS binding domain uh, of RAF proteins uh, on these different conformations, one of them would not be suitable for RAF binding because it would be uh, uh, occluded by the membrane that would be B. And this has consequences for ligand binding um, uh, uh, and obviously for function because if RAF cannot bind, signaling would not be possible. And the, uh, the accessibility of uh, different pockets on the surface of this protein appear to be sensitive uh, to, to, to orientational dynamics because some of the pockets would be occluded by the membrane uh, depending on which particular orientation we were using in this 
uh, probe based molecular dynamic uh, simulations are simply using uh, fragment molecular organic molecule fragments uh, in the solvent to to probe the interaction of putative ligands with uh, different pockets. And most recently, that has been illustrated with an actual ligand using NMR. From, this is from E. Kurala. One uh, particular ligand compound, two, actually stabilizes a given orientation, as you see it here to the right, and sort of locks it in that inactive conformation. So there is a, a lot of functional significance to this. Uh, uh, dynamics uh, of the HVR. And here is my summary, summary slide. I borrowed this from uh, Helen Mott's uh, recent review. It really hi highlights uh, everything that I was uh, talking about. So all this arrow uh, uh, in the highlights have been uh, what we have been really talking about. This Dynamics of the HVR matters for allosteric inhibition activation or dimerization. I haven't really talked about dimerization much, but we have done uh, some work, a lot of work there. Nanoclustering, uh, microdomain organization, and isoform sensitivity, uh, uh, specific interactions, and spe special uh, lateral dynamics, and uh, and so forth. So it's. It has, it has been framed in terms of is this intrinsically disordered peptide more recently, but uh, all of these issues have been studied for a long time and the, what connects them is, appears to be this disordered region or the HVR. And with that, I thank many people uh, in the lab who have worked on this over the years, uh, collaborators, especially John Hancock and uh, uh, Yong Zhou, uh, uh, worked on uh, all of the experimental data I have uh, discussed and uh, funding agencies, computational resources. And thank you very much for your patience uh, and for listening. Thank you, Alex, for a wonderful talk. And so we already have uh, a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, Bikash, if you could promote um, Yang Shuang Wang to the panel. And Alex, if you look in the Q&A, you can also read the questions, but we'll, we'll invite um, the person who asked the question to just ask it himself. So you can go ahead and, and ask it. Yeah, so I enjoy your talk. So this is the one from University of Michigan. I'm a colleague of uh, Rams. So I work on the GAUG. I'm interested in how ROS, different ROS localize to different subcellular localization differently. Like, uh, you know, uh, K ROS and ROS are all known to be on the Gauji. What mm -hmm. makes this difference? Or uh, what does that change the property of the proteins, including, like, uh, you know, oligomerization or you mm -hmm. clustering and so on? Um, as far as I know, not much work has been done on oligomerization clustering uh, of RAS proteins in uh, internal organelles. Uh, this, these proteins um, uh, tend to cycle between uh, plasma membrane bound and uh, in, uh, endomembrane and Golgi and so forth, as you might know. Um, their half-life of residence varies, but they, they go to the, those different compartments. There were uh, papers that uh, suggested that they even signal from the Golgi or ER, I don't know, from the different uh, internal organelles. Mm -hmm. But whether they form clusters there and how they form clusters, I don't know if there is any data. All the clustering studies that I know were on the plasma membrane. Um, but whether the, well, if your question is whether the HBR, the lipid anchor, would uh, have uh, an impact in either bi membrane binding, binding to membranes of those organelles, or maybe also uh, dimerization clustering, I would suspect they will have a role. Uh, but nobody studied it as far as I, I can tell. I could be. So PS is not, not known to form a cluster, unlike a lipid raft, you know, glycolipids, sphingolipid uh, cholesterol, they form clusters. PS normally, we don't think they tend to form clusters. Do you think the lipid play a, play a big role here for the clustering? 
it, it, I, I think of it more an interplay between the peptides and the lipids rather than uh, the, the, the peptides going to a preformed uh, raft or, 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 or domain. So uh, the, clearly the, they co-localize, right? And if, uh, if the TK peptides uh, are, are, are uh, surrounded by multiple PS species, and if multiple TK uh, or RAS, uh, Keras, for example, come together, then you would imagine that there would be an associated clustering uh, uh, of PS. So, but in the absence of RAS or other uh, co-clustering, uh, the proteins PS may not form uh, raft-like domains on its own. Particularly the PS that uh, we, I have been talking about, which are the, the, the asymmetric and unsaturated, they tend to go to mm -hmm. the LD domain. And Keras, for example, is preferential, uh, preferentially localized at the LD domains. HRAS is another story that's also sensitive to cholesterol, so it would go to uh, LO domains. So I agree with you, PS on its own may not form clusters. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So our next uh, question is by Christian. And if we could promote him. Sure. Um, hello. Um, Hi. I, I, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, you mentioned in, in one of your last slides, uh, the work of Mitsui Kura. And, and mm -hmm. that I know, know a little bit since I'm from NMR. Mm -hmm. And as far as I remember there, it was the orientation of the RAS uh, yes. on the membrane that, that, that was changing. My question is in the depending on the mutants and, and so on. My question was, what, what is the driver of these nanoclusters? Is this, uh, does this happen um, for, the, for the RAS in the absence of any other protein or does it need another um, component uh, to, to, to be there? And in the case it does not need another component, mm -hmm. is it more the membrane part or more the, 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 the kind of the globular part, which is outside of the membrane, which defines the, the, the clustering? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So, so uh, I, I think there are multiple answers to that. The first is, if you take the lipid anchor alone of HRAS, for example, it forms nanoclusters without, mm -hmm. in the absence of the rest of the protein. So that would, uh, the same with, with uh, lipid anchor of uh, etra, uh, Keras. They just tend to go to different domains. Uh, the, the lipid anchor of Etras would prefer uh, raft-like domains. That of the, the Keras, which I, we call TK, tend to go to liquid disorder domains. But they form mm -hmm. nanoclusters on their own. There is, I think, enough data uh, to, to, to be convinced of that. Our own simulations using the Martini model were, were uh, we're asking that same question. Is, is this, are they enough uh, to form uh, nanoclusters? And at least in, in silico, they form uh, nanoclusters on their own. They don't need anything. What they needed was membrane phase separation. So the, the, the clusters they form in the pure form, uh, in the absence of domains, the membrane domains, uh, tend to be very, very unstable. They form and deform very rapidly. So when we have these domain boundaries, the clusters tend to be long-lived. So that was our observation. Uh, so therefore, my uh, conclusion from that is clustering is probably intrinsic, but its stability and uh, in terms of uh, half-life and in terms of domain size uh, might be facilitated by the environment, by the uh, lipids uh, around them, or the presence of domains or the could I ask a follow-up on mm -hmm. that? And um, so, um, I mean, look, looking at the lipid anchor, mm -hmm. one looks at the um, kind of the area that it covers by displacing then other lipids that would be in the membrane. Mm -hmm. I assume that, that uh, this area that co it covers is much smaller than that of the, of the RAS um, globular part that is uh, sitting <sighs> on the membrane. So just geometrically, I would imagine that um, if it is really the, the driver is the, is, the, is the membrane anchor, mm -hmm. uh, geometrically it, it would be unstable when attached to the globular protein just because it pushes it apart, unless there's a very curved 
uh, membrane or so, which which would uh, could accommodate that. Is, is that a concern? Or uh, no, the, the, again another good point. I was going to come back to the role of the rest of the protein. I think the rest of the protein also plays a role. And uh, and our uh, I didn't talk about our efforts at dimerization and cluster and clustering of the full length protein, but my, what I think is that the the rest of the catalytic domain itself have, uh, has some weak uh, uh, affinity or a capacity uh, for self-interaction. So when you have the catalytic domain involved, the lipid, the, the clusters that are for, that are formed by the, the, the lipid anchors alone would have to be reorganized. Would have to be, my guess is that they would be loosened up in the presence of the rest of the protein. And the area you were referring to would therefore increase. So this would, in the, in the full length protein, the, the role of the lipid anchor would have to be slightly different compared to the isolated lipid anchor. And the catalytic domain should also contribute. And th that is when other, scaffold, the, other scaffolding protein and uh, uh, the uh, actin uh, uh, structure would come into play uh, from helping stabilize this cluster through what uh, the Japanese group will, we used to call this uh, uh, fence-like uh, uh, organizations. Uh, was it pickets and, and fences, is that what they call them? So, the, so the, it's an interplay among a variety uh, of, of uh, factors that will lead to this. Uh, again, they, they are still transient, as you know, to, to, uh, but they, they, uh, they can form and deform within probably uh, less than a second. Uh, but that requires an interplay uh, between the HBR, the lipid anchor, the lipid environment, the catalytic domain, and also uh, proteins around uh, RAS. Does that thanks, address thanks your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Yeah, so. the area concern is true, but uh, the, the, it, it would have to be uh, different, or at least slightly different, between the isolated lipid anchors and uh, the full length protein. And remember, the EM images, even with, for the lipid anchors, they use these GFP uh, tags, and that is a very large one. So the, the area we're talking about there, too, it's not really the very direct, very tight interaction between the peptides that, uh, that we have in mind. It is the lipid mediated pro proteolipid assemblies, even even for the peptides in the, in the cell. In silco, of course, you know, we, don't, we don't have the GFP, so they, they directly uh, can interact, but they need these surrounding lipids contributing to, to, that, to that interaction, okay? Okay, thank you. And so our next question, and Vishak, if you could promote Rashik to the panel. He's already there. So, over there. Okay, go ahead. You can ask your question. Yeah, um, beautiful talk. Um, so my question was related to those lysine to alanine mutations mm -hmm. for the C-terminal uh, intrinsically disordered domain of RAS. Mm -hmm. So that many of the lysine to alanine mutations um, modulated the membrane binding to an extent. However, for quite a few of them, mm -hmm. the activity didn't actually change. So I'm wondering if the lysines uh, compensate for each other and if so, what is the uh, unique role of lysine 197? I think that was the one that had the greatest activity change. Uh, 177, perhaps. 177, yes. Yeah, the, and the mutations are to uh, Q. Glu uh, glutamine. Yes, the glutamine mutations, yeah. yes. Glutamine mutations. Uh, if there are some compensatory, compensatory roles, uh, it is possible, but the, the, our we haven't really thought about it from that angle. Uh, our own interpretation was this. The, some of these lysines, the, even the wild type, would form more persistent hydrogen bonds with PS comp compared to the others. Some of the, the, the other lysines were actually, at least in the simulations, would point to solvent, to water, and they don't directly contribute to, 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 to binding to PS. And if you meet, meet those residues, assuming that the backbone conformation would not drastically change and reorient everything, if you just assume that everything stays the same, then it would not have an impact on uh, lipid uh, binding or, or lipid sorting. 
but probably the, the, the right answer is a com combination of many factors. We have seen that the backbone changes conformation that this is uh, the, uh, upon mutation of this uh, lysines to glutamine. Uh, as, so that would mean that maybe some of the other uh, lysines that were not contributing initially would uh, would be activated, so to speak, and, and now contribute for binding and compensate, as you said, or uh, other uh, factors uh, come into play that originally five licenses were contributing, and if you get rid of the first five, then you would probably not lose much. Uh, but uh, it could be a combination of all of these. Good question. Uh, so I was muted. Our next question is, if you could read it, Alex, it's an anonymous question from um, the chat, oh. the Q&A box. Okay. In addition to observing protein localization at the domain interface, do you observe a strong orientational preference in the angular distribution? If so, does that facilitate dimerization? Uh, Okay, the angular distribution. Uh, it's, this is this is a good question. We haven't spent a lot of time looking at the angular uh, uh, distributions, uh, but my sense is that the domain interface. So uh, my, my sense is that uh, it might have an impact on dimerization. And so the, the complication here is that dimerization uh, typically uh, refers to the full length protein and might involve the catalytic domain. Uh, and our uh, clustering or nano clustering simulations were done only for uh, the, or at least analyzed in detail only for the peptide, a lipid anchor of HRAS, and those go, go to the domain boundaries, and at least at low temperatures, they form some more or less linear uh, organizations uh, on the membrane. And if the full length protein does the same, but our, I should caution that our initial uh, simulations of HRAS uh, using uh, Martini. Uh, had a lot of issues because of the stickiness of the interactions. Uh, as that aside, that led to a slight a different organization uh, on domain boundaries. That's, that was not as linear as the uh, uh, lipid anchors on their own. So the, therefore the angular di distributions uh, the, might be different. And if they are different, they might have an impact on dimerization, but all of this is more or less a speculation. We haven't directly tested this, tested this, unfortunately. Okay, so thank you, Alex, for generously giving your time to answer these questions. Um, if there, I don't see any more questions in Q and A. If someone has a question, they can raise your hand. Can I ask? And uh, Rams has raised his hand. Go ahead, Rams. Alex, that was a beautiful talk. Uh, okay. uh, a variety of topics related to RAS and membrane binding. Very exciting. So my question is related to Griesinger's question on lipid and its role on membrane association and clustering, particularly on the LOLD ordered domains in between that the bound at the at the boundary you have uh, the weakest weakest uh, section weakest region of the membrane is going to be at the boundary. We know that amyloid peptides antimicrobial aggregate in that boundary and disturb the membrane. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how much of the physical property of that boundary plays a role on clustering you know, RAS protein. And is there any consequence on membrane disruption because of that? I, I, I think the physical properties of the boundary are in fact really critical uh, for, for clustering and stabilizing the clusters. Uh, I say that because uh, we varied the, the simulation temperatures at the time as a measure of domain stability and looked at the lifetime of the different clusters. And there is a direct correlation between the stability of that domain 
uh, and the, the, the stability of the clusters. We also varied the cholesterol content and uh, that led to the same uh, contributions. And also in reverse, the aggregation of these peptides, we also used other more artificial peptides uh, use, using DPC type simulations. Aggregation of the peptides in domain boundaries redu reduces line tension. So there is this, uh, uh, how, uh, how, how do you call it? They, 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 they kind of favor each other. Uh, and uh, the uh, aggregates uh, for stabilize domain boundaries and domain boundaries in return stabilize uh, or increase the lifetime at least uh, and also domain size uh, of aggregates. So from that, we, I was personally thinking that this uh, interfaces in general uh, might be favored by most aggregating uh, species, uh, whether it is peptides or proteins. So, and the, 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 the ability to form uh, interfaces, whether it is lipid, lipid, or maybe protein, protein type interfaces, uh, might be important for any oligomerizing uh, proteins or, 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 or biomolecules. I don't know if that makes, makes sense, but that is what- I think that makes sense. This is kind you. of analysis led, led me to, to, to believe. So uh, Giuseppe Melacini who left the uh, um, Zoom, uh, he has a question, he emailed me. Can mm -hmm. I read it for you? Yeah, sure. How non-additive lipid binding relates to lipid sorting by the KRAS membrane anchoring region? How non-additive lipid binding relates to lipid sorting by the KRAS membrane binding protein? Um, membrane anchoring region. I, uh, uh, okay, I, I think... There, there are probably mix up the, the non additive uh, in terms of free energy that I talked about for was for HRAS, not for KERAS. Mm -hmm. KERAS has only one pharmaceutical tail, it, it, so there is uh, the, the so, so the additivity I was talking about was when we have more than one lipid modification. So HRAS tended to have three lipid modifications two palmit oil and one pharmaceutical. And uh, in terms of insertion free energy, they were they, they tend uh, the two palmitols. Uh, one of the palmitols is probably not even required, so there is more than enough free energy provided by the uh, the pharmacy and the palmitol. Uh, and how that uh, might relate to lipid sorting, we haven't worked uh, directly uh, on uh, ETRAS uh, for the later part of the work that was KERAS. So I can't, I can't directly respond to it, but my, uh, my, my, my guess would be this. When we have these two uh, palmitoyl groups, that is, that may not be, the, the extra one might, may not be required for insertion, but once inserted, lateral dynamics might be slightly affected by the, by, by the number of these saturated acyl uh, tails present uh, in the peptide. And uh, that would uh, obviously have an impact on the lipid sorting if we can uh, broaden the, the idea of lipid sorting in, in terms of uh, forming domains and uh, interacting in, across domains, that kind of thing. But uh, this acyl chain selectivity and interplay between uh, head group and, uh, and uh, charger groups, that does not apply for the H aspect type that I was, I was talking about. That was entirely for Keras. At least that's what we have been working on so far. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions? If not, um, Ram, should, should we, we yeah. we've kept okay. Alex a long thank time. You, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Alex, for staying <laughs> past eight o'clock. Um, so please join me in thanking Alex for a truly fantastic talk. And um, if you want to watch it again, I, I think Alex is going to be posting it or Rams will be posting it on YouTube in the coming weeks. So thank you again, Alex. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Rams. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much, Alex, Bye. for the excellent. Bye, Amadio. Thank you, Amadio. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Amadio. Thanks for Bye, guys.
it was a great talk, Alex. Really enjoyed oh. it. I know it's oh, not uh, it's not easy to summarize in a short time. That because it's a very complex um, a biological pro biophysical problem. You have lipids and oligomerization. You have like a dynamics. I wanted to ask you another question. When mm -hmm. the membrane anchored, we know that the protein uh, time scale of motion is going to change for re residues in different region of the protein is going to be different than what when it is not anchored. Do you think that motion, time scale of motion reduction itself plays a role um, in, in biological function? Um, the time scale of the dynamics, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that should have a role. I, I was, uh, the, I try to stay away from these kinetic aspects of things because it's, they're, they're very hard to to connect to, to, to biology. For example, we have this yeah. reorientation dynamics uh, that yeah. I try to summarize in a couple of slides. Uh, uh, the time scale, at least what we see in simulations, is, is really fast. It's, it's sub micro second time scale is what we see. Of course, the simulations might be really. Yeah, and you membrane anchor it, and then hopefully the residues which are interacting with the lipid bilayer, there are charged residues that's going to slow down um, the motion of other residues nearby to, to at least maybe um, a lower microsecond time scale. Right. Um, and no, they slow it down in, uh, by, uh, for uh, another reason too. The, some residues from the catalyst domain are directly interact with lipids, right? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And it's, it spends some time there. So it's yep. not really freely diffusing as, as, as we would expect right. it to, into right. yeah. solution. So the, the yeah. issue now is, is this, the, the, you know, the, 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 is this time scale that the, yeah. the binding and releasing, binding and releasing, is that, is there any correlation with that kind of motion? And the, yeah. on, okay, for example, on off uh, yeah. rates of RAS, interacting with its effector proteins or, or modulators. So we, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. There is no direct link, but clearly it should affect, the, that's my, my guess at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should yeah. somehow yeah. affect the-, the it also, Yeah, it should also increase um, affinity for other proteins or maybe ligands or uh, oligomerization and things like that. So there's this maybe a, a, it's very difficult to disentangle Membrane association versus dynamics slowing down, they're all like convoluted, I guess. It's yeah. Kind of and angle, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but I think we need to do a lot of work. But but now, luckily, there are so many people working on RAS. So, yeah. Uh, all, all Which, is Which is good. Which is good. Great. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you. I never met you before. So <laughs> uh, we actually met uh, Rams uh, in Galveston. We 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 had dinner. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You were there in that. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When when you gave a talk a few years, yeah. no, a few years ago. Okay. Yes. Yes. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good.